Can you see my royal family right there? Thanks, Kayla. My cat is sorted. He stopped biting me, so now we can actually start the video. <laughs> Hello, bibliophiles, and welcome back. My name is Jill, and I am the book bully, and I'm here today to do the most exciting video of my entire booktube career. I mean, it's only been a short career, but I'm very excited about it. This video is the reason I got into booktube in the first place. I love watching year-end wrap-ups. This is kind of our bread and butter here on booktube. I keep very rigorous stats on all my books, and I have done so for many, many years, uh, almost 10. And I really wanted to share the books you know, that I read and how I felt about them as a whole. So I know lots of people do like their 10 worst books or like 10 best books or whatever. I wanted to talk about all of the books I read this year because I've read 104 books this year. I just finished the 104th. Um, and I really like when people talk about everything they've read all year and I haven't done that on this channel. So I wanted to talk about every book I've read. <laughs> so I've decided to do um, four different videos where I do my lowest rated books of the year, the books that are just okay, the books I think are really good, and then my favorites of the whole year. So I can encompass all 104 books I've read in that spread of videos. And today I'm here to do the most salacious one the most disappointing slash lowest rated slash worst books I've read all year. This is the smallest category of all the books I've read this year. Uh, so that's good. I've had a really, really good reading year in terms of like not only amount, but uh, books I, I really liked and loved many of the books I've read this year. I found some like new all time favorites this year but there were some duds and it's time to share them with you. So I've sorted these into four categories. The first is DNF. The second is books that just weren't for me. Um, the third is books I was most disappointed by and the fourth is books I think are just bad. <laughs> just objectively bad. Um, recognizing that I am a subjective opinion but from <laughs> I'm gonna say they are objectively bad. Does that make sense? Doesn't matter. So let's get started. So the first category is books I've DNF'd. I have one book in this category. That's not true. I have two other ones that I have DNF'd temporarily. I will definitely go back to them. Um, I only got like a chapter in and I don't really consider a book a DNF if I only get like 30 pages in. To me, I have to get like a significant amount of way in and decide to stop reading it before it's officially a DNF or I have to know I'm never gonna go back to it. And the only one that fits this category is The Wanderers by Meg Howry. This book is about a mission to Mars that's happening and they pick three astronauts, they meaning the people who are paying for the mission, I guess, pick three astronauts to go into this like simulation for a, like a, a long period of time, like eight months or a year, or maybe three years, I can't even remember, um, to prepare for what it'd be like to be on Mars. Um, that is kind of it. <laughs> and I got 100 pages into this book and I don't even really know what was happening. Um, it's slow, but there's also a lot of characters, a lot of perspectives. Um, nothing really happens, at least to like the page. Like, I think I got to 115 or something pages. It was really interfering with my reading. I just didn't want to read it. And I am very much a, I tend to read like one book at a time. I, I might have a couple things on the go, but I generally just focus on like one book and finish it. And I found like I didn't want to read it. So therefore it was like really hindering my reading. And so I just said, why am I reading it? <laughs> I don't need to read this. So I gave it to my cousin. She really enjoyed it. And uh, that was not a book wasted. So somebody got to enjoy it and I got to stop reading it. The second category is books that are just not for me. And I have six books in this category. These are books that I can see why some people would like them, but for me, they just didn't work. And I think that they have some problems with them. The first is The Heat of the Day by Elizabeth Bowen. I read this. This is my first read of 2019. It was for my book club. And uh, I can't even really remember what it's about. I think <laughs> um, it's set in post-war London. It's sort of about Russian spies, maybe German spies. There's a spy. I'm not sure what the country is. Um, it's also a kind of a love story. What I do remember is a lot of the characters have the same names. Like there's a Rodney and a Robert and a Roddy maybe. And all the women have really similar names. And if you don't know yet, I struggle with names <laughs> and I just want everyone to have, all the characters have very distinguished, pronounceable names. That is what I want in a book and this uh, bothered me. Um, the writing was really dense. Maybe it's a function of like when it was written, but I actually think it 
it was a kind of unanimous among my book club that this was a difficult read. Maybe for someone else this would be a hit, but for me it was like, it didn't hit any boxes and I found it um, a slog. And I definitely would have DNF'd it if it wasn't for my book club. The next book I mentioned fairly recently on this channel in my November wrap up that was Mad, Bad, and Dangerous to Know by Colm Toybin. Tobin. Something like that. This is about the fathers of Wild Yates and Keats. And this book was just like, I couldn't rate it because it wasn't for me. I talk about it more in that wrap up if you want to know my feelings about it, but it really feels like you have to have a really solid understanding of the lives of those three authors before you even go into this book, uh, which I don't. It also is very heavy on the quotations from letters from the fathers. So there's less kind of um, building of the narrative up by the actual author and more reliance on kind of analysis of the text of the letters from the fathers and it's just not for me like not that that style of writing is not for me but that style of writing with that particular topic it just didn't work for me. I don't have any connection to this book so it's not the right book for me. The third book that just wasn't for me was a book called Misconduct by Penelope Douglas I think her name is. This is very much a romance but heavy on the smut. Um, I picked this up in earlier this year when I needed something that was like completely brainless um, because I was stressed and tired and it was winter and <laughs> you sort of want to like um, let your brain just kind of turn to liquid as you read something that's just a delight. Um, this is not for me because I don't read romance. I don't like romance. I don't know if I don't like it. Um, I'm just not. I don't care. I also have no reference point because I don't really read it. So I don't know if this is a bad or a good book. I will say that there is some non-consensual sex in this book, which is always a big no. But I mean, I, I've heard that other people really love her. If you're really into romance and really into smut, maybe she's the right person. Um, but I will not be rushing out to read any more books like this by her or in this genre anytime soon. The fourth book that's not for me is The Yiddish Policeman's Union by Michael Shabon. Shabon? Shabon. Michael Shabon whatever his name is. One of those pronunciations maybe. <laughs> Again, names are difficult. It takes place in an alternative history where um, post-World War II Jewish people made Alaska their homeland as opposed to Israel. That's the the framing. And then it's also a murder mystery set in that particular um, space. I can't remember what they call it, but it's somewhere in Alaska. And it's a murder mystery. It's also like an alternative history. It's also a, like kind of a a romancy kind of thing. It revolves around chess. And let me tell you, one thing I really hate in books is chess. I find it inherently dull. It is so boring. And I also, I mean, I love a whodunit, but this one was a slow burn and you kind of felt like you were losing the mystery at parts because there were so many other kind of narratives happening. Um, there's, you know, there's a lot of internal conflict with the with the main police officer. I can't even remember what his name is. Um, <laughs> but there's also um, a lot of Yiddish words used in this because they're a Yiddish society. Um, and I read this on my e-reader and I didn't realize until I had finished the book that there was a glossary at the back <laughs> that was supposed to help you understand some of these words. And it's very inaccessible on an e-reader so that did not fly for me. Um, again, I can see why some people would like this book. I, all, I think it's too long. I think it's too vague. I struggle personally with alternative histories. Uh, so in general, this book was not for me, didn't love it, won't read it again, wouldn't recommend it. The fifth book on this list is a book called Semiosis by Sue Burke. I picked this up because my good friend Aaron, who is my book bosom buddy and my book guru, he read it, he loved it, and I picked it up thinking I would also read it and enjoy it. Um, I didn't. I, this book is about, um, what is it about? It's about people who leave Earth to settle on a new planet they call Pax. There has been, been violence and there's been a lot of death and like the Earth is dying so they had to resettle this planet and they bring all their science and their knowledge and they can kind of like um they can heal people quite quickly and they have a like it's advanced kind of society. Um this book was a problem for me because I felt like the actual plot changed multiple times throughout the book. Um the first kind of three or four chapters. I mean, so I should say it's multi-generational. It falls, you know, uh, many, many, many years in this uh, this new settlement's lifespan. Uh, the first couple years, you, the, the first couple of like perspectives that we get, 
you kind of I kind of thought it was going one direction and I was really excited by that direction and then we moved to a kind of a new battle that we thought was going to rage between like the, the settlement and then the new settlement and then you move to like a third kind of like conflict and it just felt really all over the place and really disjointed and um I thought there were some interesting things happening here it's kind of a biological thriller which is really interesting um but it just like it was too disconnected it was too messy um and the writing sometimes felt like it was a slog to get through uh so this one is just not for me. Now I do know some people who loved it, um, but for me it was just a miss. And the last book I read this year that was very much a not for me book was Safe Words by Michelle Brown. This is a collection of poetry. I believe Michelle Brown is a Canadian poet. Uh, yes. This book of poetry I read very early in the year and I picked it up from my favorite bookstore. They have a great poetry section and I love to just pick things up randomly and read them. Um, but this was a miss. Uh, I just felt like none of the poems made sense. And you know, there's always this kind of feeling on booktube about how you can't criticize poetry or people feel like they can't criticize it because they, they're not poets or they're not scholars or whatever. I think that's bullshit. Um, I think that you, sh like, everyone can understand poetry. That's just gotta find the right poetry for you. This one's just not for me. Um, none of the poems connected with me. I found it really, really obtuse. Like, it required a... And I went back and read it again. I still got nothing out of it or very little out of it. There were some I thought were okay. There was a couple poems I thought were, you know, some some nice pretty lines in there. Um, but as a collection, it didn't, it didn't have an overarching theme to me. It didn't have any connection to it. It just didn't work for me. So this next section is probably the saddest section of this whole video, which is the books I'm most disappointed by this year. And I had several books this year, which really disappointed me. Um, high hopes that were dashed by the last pages of these books. The first I'll talk about, because I've talked about it a lot, I think almost every video I've done this year, is The Bells of Old Tokyo, The Travels in Japanese Time by Anna Sherman. This book is not terrible, but it's very disappointing. This is supposed to be a book that looks at the history of Tokyo and um, how telling the story of Tokyo through the way they used to tell time, through these very particular bells that were rung at different parts of the city uh, for different times of the day to signal different things. This is not what this book does. This book is a mess. This book is, um, it's not poorly written, but it's not great. It doesn't follow any kind of linear structure about history, which is like fine. Like you don't have to follow a linear structure to tell the history. But what happens is it doesn't um, adhere to any sort of real narrative. We talk about love hotels in the present day. We talk about coffee shops. There's a coffee shop she keeps going back to to talk about the Japanese language. Um, again, interesting. Not what this book is supposed to be, from what I understood. We talk a lot about um, a clock, like this person who collects clocks, um, a prison that was in Tokyo, about the Second World War, about the bombs. Like there's all kinds of stuff in there. It's not uninteresting. It's just not cohesive or coherent. Um, it just isn't what I was expecting and wanted from this book. So this is my biggest disappointment of the year. Another book I was very disappointed by this year was Elmet by Fiona Mosley. I thought for sure I was going to give this book a five star um, and I did not. Surprise, surprise. This book is about two siblings and a father who kind of go off the grid in, I think it's like set in Northern England, and they go to live in the woods on the land and they are really separate from all people. Um, the kids get a bit of schooling from like a neighborhood friend down the road, like in the, well, She's another woman who lives off the grid in the woods and she teaches them. The father is very violent. He's like a fighter. That's how he makes money or he used to make money. Um, so this book has a very, to me, it has a very timeless quality, which I really enjoyed. It could be set now. It could be set 50 years ago. It could be 150 years ago. You're not really sure about when it's set. Um, the reason I was really put off by this book or why I didn't love this book was one, the narration uh, didn't make any sense to me. It's told kind of an omniscient third person narration um, from the perspective of like a 13 year old, 12 or 13 year old boy named Danny. But the voice does not belong to a 12 or 13 year old boy. It belongs to like a, like a much older kind of wiser slash almost like a very feminine voice that kind of narrates the whole thing. Um, it just doesn't jive. It doesn't make sense. It's very, it really is jarring. I found it very difficult to reconcile the narration with the tone of this book. So that was really difficult, like for me, as I was reading it to kind of make sense of. But what I found the most off-putting with this book was the tone, the end of the book is so vastly, uh, different in tone and style and expectation from the first like three quarters of this book 
um, the end of this book, it comes out of nowhere. It's completely out of character with the rest of the book, with the rest of the characters. It's incredibly violent, incredibly um, shocking, but like not in a, like this book doesn't prepare you to be shocked. You know how some books like thrillers and stuff like you're supposed to, you know you're just gonna come. This does not have any kind of uh, warning and it also doesn't make any sense the way that it kind of ends. It just feels really bizarre and like extreme and it was so off-putting that I, I remember laughing and it's a it's gruesome and it's graphic and quite violent um but I was laughing because I thought it was a joke. I was like this has to be a dream because this can't be really happening. Uh so yeah this was such a letdown for me and um I would not recommend it. I mean I might read something else by Fiona Mosley but this one here is like big ol' swing and a miss. Another bummer this year was West by Karis Davies. I picked this up because uh Simon from Savage Reads talked about- he talked about this book a lot last year or at some point. Um gosh maybe it was this year. This year has been so long. Who knows? Um but he talks about- he talked about Carrie Davies and how he loved her writing and he talked about wanting to read this book. I picked it up. Um this book is- here's how I feel about this book. Why was it written? <laughs> I have no idea the purpose of this book. Nothing happens uh or very very little happens. Um there's very little character development. There's it's not even like a, a family drama. It's kind of like, why did the story need to be told? That's how I feel about this. This is a story of a daughter and uh, a probably 12, 13 year old daughter and a father who becomes obsessed with trying to find these like mammoth creatures that live in the west of um, the Americas. And he abandons his daughter in the northeast when they're on a farm, of course. And he just abandons her and her, leaves her to her aunt his sister, and goes off to find these mammoth beasts. And then the aunt, you know, doesn't lo doesn't really treat the daughter super well. Um, and then the father goes through several years, several years, guys, several years in this couple of like 100 and something, it's like less than 200 pages, 150 something pages. Um, and doesn't find the, spoiler alert, doesn't find the mammoth creatures. There's um, an Indian representation in here, which is actually really interesting. But there is a lot of time spent on talking about clothing and trading materials but like n very little time the daughter's kind of forgotten <laughs> toward the end um there's of course spoiler again there's um some a potential rape scene in here like a lot happens but nothing happens you know like it's just I don't know why this book is written I don't know what the point of it is I, there was no emotional weight to me I had no connection to the characters I had no connection to the story I wasn't interested in anything was happening this was 150 pages and it took me like two months to read because I was bored to death so disappointment here for this one um I would probably read something else from Karis Davis but this book I would I would avoid this book because just don't waste your time read something good. Another disappointment this year is The Bus on Thursday by Shirley Baird. I have heard Harriet from Harriet Rosie and Simon from Savage Reads talk about this book and talk about how funny this is, how like thrilling and shocking and um, like kind of weird and paranormal this is. So I picked it up. I mean, those are not really my genres, but I was like, sure, let's try something new. Um, this is an Australian book too. So I was like, let's get some Australian books into my repertoire. Like, let's just expand. Um, I really didn't like this book. Um, one, it's not funny. Or if it is funny, I don't find it very funny. Um, and I find lots of things funny, but this did not work for me. Um, there's a part in this book where, so the main, so this book is about, if you don't know, um, a young girl who has cancer and she is recovering and she's, and wants to go back to work, but she has, she can't go back to work where she lives. So she has to go to a small town, I think in New Zealand, um, and becomes the teacher there. Um, but she takes over from a teacher who went missing. And so, she is coming into a, a like a school that had a beloved teacher. She's gone, she's taking the place, and she's also been out of work for a while, so she's uncomfortable and she's young. She's kind of like experiencing some weird things, so it's just, you know, an all around kind of an, an, an unsettling position to start from. Then the weird stuff starts to happen and partially she's her own worst enemy and partially like the what's really happening, we don't really know. Here's an example of why this book uh, fails for humor for me. There's a part in this book where she's trying to explain to her small group of students um, what suicide is and 
somebody has fallen off a cliff. So she's trying to explain this to the kids. And it's this, the way it's written, you can tell that it's supposed to be awkward and funny, or the author thinks it is. It is not. It is incredibly uncomfortable. It is cringy and like not funny cringy. Like, like, I wish I wasn't reading this cringy. Like you're embarrassed for this person. It just is like, and, but you, you can tell that she thinks it's funny. And I, that's kind of the humor that's in here. And it just doesn't work for me. I just thought this book was a bit of a mishmash and I felt a bit like, it felt rudimentary to me and a bit juvenile um, and not funny. I think I take the most offense to the fact that this is actually not funny and people who think it's funny are wrong. And my final disappointment is The Body by Bill Bryson. I was so looking forward to this. I'm a huge Bill Bryson fan. If you've watched a couple of my videos, you'll know that I love him. This book is very Bill Bryson. It's very, you know, in the same genre and vein of the books he's written before. Same kind of tone, same kind of like, uh, the same things I love where he takes kind of forgotten pieces of history, little nuggets of people's lives and tells them like funny parts or interesting parts or like shines light on people who didn't have the attention that they deserve throughout history, especially in the medical world. Um, so I loved those parts of this book. Um, I definitely found it interesting and like you know, the first kind of 30 to 50 pages I was like, oh, it's so good to be reading Bill Bryson again. Um, but we get to around page 100 and, and things start to go downhill from here. And for me, this book, why it's disappointing was there's a lot of focus on um, fat people and how fat we are. And it's a lot of fat shaming, a lot of using humor, humor to make fun of people who are fat, to talk about how we are destroying our bodies. Um, it really is, I mean, it's obviously a personal thing for me. I just something that I, I, I refuse to read that kind of, that kind of thing. I refuse to engage with it. Um, I think it's outdated. I think it's old-fashioned. I think it's unhelpful. And I really I was was off put by this. It really um, tainted the whole book for me. So even the good parts I couldn't enjoy because I was so left such a bad taste in my mouth of all of the kind of criticisms and cruelty toward fat people <laughs> that this book has. So this was a big, a big disappointment for me and a um, huge huge letdown for how I feel about Bill Bryson's writing in general. I don't think it's a bad book, I just think it's um, just as, it's unfortunate that that's the tone it's taken. Okay, we're on to the last category of this video, which is books that I just think are bad, just straight up bad. So the first book in this list I will mention very briefly because I don't want to dwell on it, I don't think you should read it. It's Living and Dying on the Internet by Alex Day. I picked this up this year because I was uh, around the YouTubes, watching the YouTubes in 2014 when the YouTube scandal broke about a lot of YouTuber stars who were having relationships with minors or having non-consensual relationships with um, younger females um, or being emotionally abusive and manipulative. Alex Day was one of those people who was caught up in that crossfire uh, and he was kind of like white from the internet and probably for good reason. <laughs> Um, but I read this book because I was interested in saying, okay, what is the perspective of someone who's been through that? And how, like, what is, is he remorseful? Has he learned anything? What is that story like? What's the other side of the story of not just the survivors of the women who have been the victims and the survivors of these, of this kind of abuse, um, but what is the other side of the story? What is the redemption story for the people who um, have made mistakes and they want to move on and be forgiven and apologize and, and be better people. Like, what is that story? So I was hoping to find some of that in this book. There's none of that in this book. This book is terrible. It's not, one, it's poorly written. Two, it comes across as very, like, whiny about, like, listen to how good my life was and now it's not good. Um, he also tells, like, embarrassing and very personal stories about his former friends, which feels to me um, really childish, really immature, and really inappropriate. And I was really bothered by that. Um, there is no self-reflection. There was very little, self some, but not enough. Very little self-awareness. And uh, this book is trash. It's a dumpster fire. Don't read it. And uh, don't give Alex Day your money. Um, don't support him because if he had someone who had kind of grown as a person and shown his like growth and recognized his mistakes, I would say, great, like let's let's learn from this. False, this guy is still out there being awful. So don't read this book. Okay, we're moving on from that book. Um, 
the next book I read that is just bad is the, the Worst and the Best of the Premiers and Some We Never Had by Bill Rowe. This is a Newfoundland author. This is a book about Newfoundland premiers throughout history since 1949 when we became part of Canada. Um, this book is atrocious. This is published by um, a local publishing house. Um, they are notorious for not really doing a lot of proofreading, <laughs> um, which isn't really a problem um, necessarily with this book in terms of like, you know, typos and whatever. But it's not well written. This is very much so Bill Rowe is kind of a, a known Newfoundland local writer. He has written some quite famous books, one about Danny Williams, another about... Um, I can't remember, but he has some some quite famous books that were were really well um, received. This one feels very much like a old man, um, just like reliving the past, thinking about his days working uh, in the mem in the House of Assembly. Like it just is kind of like it just feels a bit like a diary that you'd like kind of share with your friends. It's not a history book. It's not useful to like gather any real um, political or uh, his political or social or economic history of the province, which is what I was hoping to get out of this. Um, there's some like good little tidbits and stories in here, but that's like the Newfoundland way. So I guess that's okay. But um, you know, as a Newfoundland kind of like listen to your uncle tell stories around the Christmas dinner table, sure, it's fine. Um, as a piece of historical like research, it's not great. So this book is like just, it's truly, and his writing is bad. It's, it's bad. It's just bad. He's also written a book about uh, Joey Smallwood, uh, I believe, or maybe Chess Crosby, but two kind of real, I mean, are really famous premiers from our province and our province, my home province. And, um, you know, most of the focus is on them, <laughs> naturally. Um, they're people who made a lot of, a lot of waves, a lot of waves. They made a lot, they made history. Same with Danny Williams. That stuff is really interesting and useful because, but there's lots of stuff written about them. Like we don't need to have necessarily more about that, but we do need to have more about the other premiers. To me, this really failed to to excel where it could have. There's definitely a gap in like Newfoundland political history and writing about it, and like this could have filled it, and it just does a bad job of it. So this was unfortunate um, that it was not better. A book that I'm actually very sad to say is bad <laughs> is Confessions of the Fox by Jordy Rosenberg. This book is it's unfortunate that this book is not better so this uh jordy rosenberg is uh, a trans man he's also an academic he works at where is he university of massachusetts amherst so he's an academic researcher and writer this is the this is a very confusing story so let me try to see if i can summarize it quickly um this is told from kind of two we have two kind of two stories happening at the same time one, there's a Dr. Voth, is that the name? Yeah, Dr. Voth, this, we have like an intro where this Dr. Voth, who is like a historian, finds this um, manuscript about this real life um, thief named Jack Shepard, right? So this Jack Shepard was a real person, um, a well-known, like one of the best thieves apparently in history. And so Dr. Voth, this fictional character, is given this manuscript and he begins to read it and discovers that or starts to guess that Jack Shepard might have been a trans man. And we learn that through the romance love story with his uh, girlfriend, Bess. Is it Bess? Yeah. And Bess has this kind of whole backstory because she is an immigrant to the country and I can't remember where she's actually from. Um, so that's one story. So we, we get that manuscript that he, that Dr. Voth is reading. Then the other story is that Dr. Voth is kind of reading the manuscript and writing footnotes, historical footnotes or commentary on it. But additionally to that, Dr. Voth is working through their own like issues with their own body, as well as issues with like, <laughs> like getting money, like <laughs> with the university. There's like kind of a couple different conflicts going on there. This book is, it's trying to do so many things that it doesn't do any of them well. <sighs> like, I think it's really important and I'm, I'm really glad to see like a book written by a trans person about trans people like and there's multiple trans people in this book so that's really good it's also an alternative history which is kind of like the way this is written is like okay this could be kind of interesting but the things that the, the manuscript focuses on make no sense there's like a big there's a lot of sexual focus in this story is like unnecessarily so to the point of like it really like it's to me it overshadows almost everything else in this book which then diminishes the actual goal of the book which I think is to talk about how history um like I think the kind of the overall theme is that history can be interpreted in many different ways and we don't know everything that happened and people who are non-cis hetero people have existed throughout 
you know, centuries and centuries, which I think is the premise of the point of this book and also about like, identity and like how other people can help you find identity and acceptance and that kind of thing. But because there's like all this like other stuff about like there's like this weird surgery in here that is like it makes l truly truly no sense. Bess's character makes no sense. She is both a prostitute but also she is um, like a doctor. <laughs> like she performs like medical procedures. She's an expert in interpreting medical texts. Um, the friendships in here make no sense. There's a characters in here who come and go who had these like long-standing histories that are never explained they're never show were never ex shown how those friendships evolve the kind of um climactic scene in this book again it's confusing there's characters in here that we're supposed to know but are so underdeveloped throughout the whole book that like it's hard to actually piece together what's actually happening and the story of dr voth it's supposed to be kind of f funny in parts but it actually ends up being really distracting. So it's not, so I should show you that there are footnotes in here. So like, let's show you an example. There's like the text and then we have this big footnote here, which is explaining both some of the story, but also like some historical stuff as well as personal things. The footnotes are a problem because they're, they do a couple of different things. Again, providing historical t context, providing like explaining different words that are Victorian or whatever. Um, which is useful, but then we also have Dr. Voth's personal story, we have his email exchanges <clears throat> with this guy who is like gonna pay him to do this whatever with this manuscript, and then we also have like a lot of academic indulgence in here. It feels like it's written by an academic who doesn't know how to tell a story. That's that's how this book feels like. Um, it needed a better editor, it needed a more clear goal. The amount of academia that's in here is alienating for kind of the average reader. So all of that is to say, this book is a mess. <laughs> it is disorganized. It is confusing. Um, but I absolutely will read something else by Jordi Rosenberg. I think that um, it's interesting enough as a premise to keep me to come make me come back and see what else they'll write. Uh, but just just ugh, this book is it was a challenge. And uh, it's yeah, it's unfortunately it was just it was just not very good. Another book that I really did not like this year was No Exit by Taylor Adams. A friend of mine recommended this to me for a thriller and I think I realized I just don't like thrillers. <laughs> I think I'm just like not a thriller reader. Um, this is about a young girl who's going home to see her mother or father, one of her parents, I can't remember, who is going to die very soon of cancer. It's on Christmas, it's snowing, and she gets stuck um, at a rest stop. I think it's in Utah, if I'm not mistaken. And when she gets to the rest stop, there's like a couple of people there. It's something weird's going on. She goes out to like try to get cell signal to text her sister, and then she sees a child locked in a car. And that's where we go from there. Um, I did not know the child part. Like apparently this, that's on the back of the book, <laughs> but I did not know that going into it. And I was shocked when I read that. Um, so if you don't want to read a story about uh, child abuse, like don't read this one. Um, the reason I thought this book was bad was because I just, the, the amount of dispens suspension of disbelief that was required for this book, um, I couldn't do it. And I can, you know, believe almost anything. But it was like, the what they were, what the main character was supposed to be doing on no sleep, no food, the amount of physical exertion that was required of her, the mental exertion, it just felt really re both repetitive and also like unbelievable. And I, I just couldn't suspend my disbelief to kind of keep up with it. Also, because it was a closed setting, so it's set in, in the, this one, they're all, they're all snowed in, so they can't go anywhere. It's closed in this like um, rest stop area. You know, there are really good closed circle mysteries where they take place in a small, like, you know, I mean, Agatha Christie is the queen of this. Um, but this is closed circle and it feels uh, limited. Like the author needed m more like space or people or things to like do stuff with because otherwise it just felt uncreative and it felt constrained and I just by the end of it I was like I don't even care what happens to these people like all the thrill was gone because I had you know we had visited the same scene multiple times with the same people and I just was like are we back here again we know how this is going to end we've already been here or there are only so many ways out of this certain situation and I can tell you all of them and I'm not a thriller reader if I can if I can tell you what the answer is going to be then it's not a good thriller because I I also don't like to know like I don't I don't I don't want to guess like I'm very much like a I don't want to try to figure out the mystery I want to I want to be surprised when I get to the end and I just felt like 
there was no way to be surprised by this because like it was so clear from the beginning how this was gonna go so I thought this was a bad book I know I'm alone in this or I know I'm in the minority of this um but I also just think maybe thrillers aren't for me so I think this is a bad thriller but I also think that thrillers are not my genre the next book is The Book of Essie by Megan McLean Weir. I read this book on recommendation from a couple of different friends who loved it. Uh, guess what I didn't, obviously. <laughs> I did not like this. I listened to this on audiobook um, while I was painting my bedroom. And I have to say it was a really fast listen, so that's really good. Um, but I, I genuinely don't understand why people like this book. And it's baffling to me because I don't... It's not well written. The story is literally 19 kids and counting with different names and fewer children like literally like I have seen this story there's basically no difference a little bit of like a um, maybe a bit of uh what's the word uh a poetic license on the extremeness of the story but like it's nothing new that hasn't been already in the media there's also been a couple of um like TV shows based on this. I'm pretty sure that there's an episode of Law and Order SVU which is basically the story. <laughs> so like like again like it's not creative and I felt like the protagonist so Essie and then I can't remember her boyfriend's name but him he is just the two of them they're not 17 year olds they are written like adults they have the the perspective the voices the experiences of adults which makes no sense to this book like even okay if i can suspend my disbelief a little bit so okay these are obviously children who've grown up um with difficult situations both of them have different difficult situations going on um essie's been exposed to a, like a whole life of her her life has been on camera and she's had a difficult growing up experience growing up she's been abused we know all these things she's pregnant so her life is hard but also she's still 17. so the way that like your brain is not the, as developed at 17 as it is at 25 so the voice of the of the narrator makes no sense it's i i just was like i can't believe this is the perspective of these people because it just doesn't make any sense um, it fe it also feels incredibly American in the way that um, the kind of the trajectory of these people's lives is about it's about fame and money and they go to college and you get a and you get a dorm and you like you can like live the American dream like everything about it feels very American so it feels very unaware of its surroundings like I don't know if that makes any sense it feels like it's it's um, completely isolated in a bottle and it just has a certain um, vibe to it that is, it's almost like I was repulsed by the story. <laughs> yeah, the tone, the character development, the setting, like everything about it was really, really awful to me. So I don't know why people love this book. I, I don't, I genuinely don't understand it. So if you can tell me why you love this book, please do because um, I cannot find any reason why people like it other than like it's a fast read. But is that a reason to like a book? Like, I don't think so. So. If you like this book, please tell me why, because <laughs> I am baffled. I have two books left in this rant video. The Watchmaker Filigree Street by Natasha Pulley. This is my lowest rated book of the whole year. <laughs> this book I think I gave one star. This book is bad, man. This book is like, it's almost like there's chunks missing from this story. This is the story. I'm gonna try to explain what the story is because it's very complicated and it doesn't seem to make any sense, but let's see if I can explain it. This is about a guy named Thaniel. His name is Nathaniel, but he goes by Thaniel, which already I hate. Thaniel Steepleton, is that his name? Let's find out. Yep, Thaniel Steepleton. He works um, like as a telegraph operator or something in London um, in the late, like in the Victorian era, like 1880s. He goes home one day to find a watch on his, in his apartment. And he's like, huh, what is this? Weird, it has a ticking noise or whatever. And he kind of just like it's this, this beautiful beautiful watch and then there's an explosion in london and his watch it, he had his watch with him and for some reason it like made him avoid the bomb so he goes to try to find the watchmaker uh of filigree street where this guy is and then he becomes friends with the watchmaker and so there's that story he moves in with the watchmaker spoiler alert i mean that's not really a spoiler and then uh the other part is there's a girl, I can't remember her name, but she's in either Oxford or Cambridge or something. She's in school there. She's doing her PhD in like physics 
or chemistry science and she is a woman so she is not really supposed to be doing that she's supposed to be making being a homemaker so she finishes her degree but then she is kind of like told she has to get married but she also has one of these watches <laughs> and then somehow her and Daniel end up in each other's lives they find each other because of these watches and lots of other things happen there's like the guy who creates who makes the watch is uh Japanese so there's like Japanese clock making um but it becomes very clear early on there's some kind of like magic involved with this or something but that's even like leaving out a lot of stuff so this book doesn't make any sense <laughs> this book is there's almost it's, it's honestly like there's like those chunks of the plot missing I would be reading this and I would kind of read a page I'm like wait a second why is that thing happening at the bottom? And I would go back and read a couple pages. I'm like, did I miss something? It's like, no, this author just did not make that connection between point A and point B. It just out of nowhere, came out of nowhere. There is uh, moments of this where it's like kind of like a thriller where you feel like, oh, this is exciting. But then <laughs> there's nothing, it never goes anywhere. Um, and then when the action comes, it comes out of nowhere. Um, there's a bunch of like emotional things that happen here like you know uh, things that play on the emo characters emotions a lot um but we don't know how or why and also nothing really ever gets said or done in here there's a lot of tea making a lot of tea drinking um a lot of walking around lots of mention of london, london underground um but truly this there's just like there's nothing that holds this whole plot together it feels very episodic with nothing almost like there's like short stories in here and nothing that ties it together but it's not short stories it's actually supposed to be one coherent narrative um the characters are really difficult to understand the histories are difficult to understand there is no rhyme or reason to why things happen and at the end i was like what did i just read <laughs> like did that actually just happen the timeline is absolutely bonkers at the end that you can't even really by the time you've read it you have no idea what has happened i think this book is a disaster and i would love and and my whole book club agreed we all thought that this made no sense and we were all very confused and so if you love this book because i know people do love this book um please tell me below why because again i don't see it and <laughs> i would love to know why you like this book and the last book i will mention is hank green's an absolutely remarkable thing controversial i think this book is bad <laughs> i think this book suffers from not knowing who its audience is so this book if you don't know if you haven't been around booktube and seen people talk about it is the story of there's kind of to me there's there's two stories in this book there's a story of um these alien kind of the way i kind of envision them from the des description is like transformer like characters um called carls that land all over the world one night and they're aliens but no one knows how to communicate with them and what they're there for and like what's going to happen so there's that story then there's a story of this character called april may which is quite frankly the worst name in history for a character thank you very much um who s skyrockets to, to internet fame because of these alien creatures because she finds them makes a video goes viral and she has then suffered through internet fame this book is bad because it doesn't know who the audience is the plot and the characters um are kind of like a YA tone but the way it's written it's like there's so many lists in here where Hank Green describes like what Twitter is <laughs> and like what Tumblr is and how to use the internet so I'm like is this for like old people who don't know how to use the computers like who is the audience of this book um I think this maybe is the, the trouble with someone like a white male in their 40s trying to write from the perspective of like a queer woman in her 20s like I think that maybe there's a disconnect for that way um I also think that's a problem like why is Hank Green writing from the perspective of a bisexual 20 something year old woman I've heard him say that he wanted to have more diversity in his books um but I don't know if that's the way to do it because it just comes across as disingenuous it doesn't come across as a real person at all um I thought the alien storyline was like kind of interesting but then there's all these like childish juvenile elements in here like um there's something about grape jelly how the the crawls are either made of or leave behind grape jelly which is some kind of like inside joke i think for the community that he's part of but um or maybe it isn't but either way it's like weird and like not funny and confusing and i think it it's actually like brings down his book a lot it really lowers the tone it really like cheapens the story 
And I felt very much like there was there's two stories going on here and they were going in parallel and they did not jive at all. Um, I think this book really suffers again from not knowing who its audience is and it suffers from not knowing what it's trying to do. Is it an alien story or is it trying to talk about the perils of the internet? It doesn't really decide on either one of those things and it therefore really suffers um, from its own like lack of indecision. I think it's getting a lot of like accolades because Hank Green wrote it and Hank Green is a smart guy. He is like the YouTube dad. He does a lot of really good work for the internet um, but maybe he shouldn't be a writer <laughs> or maybe he shouldn't write this kind of book uh, or you know whatever people can write whatever they want but um, we should be honest with the fact that this book is not good <laughs> and uh, I will not be reading the second book in this series. I was actually really annoyed when I saw that it was a, there was more to it because I was like oh I just wanted it to be over. <laughs> So those are my lowest rated books of the year. I would love to know what you think about these books. If you've read them, let me know down below if you agree with me, if you disagree with me, and let's have a conversation because I would love to know um, if you liked these books, why? Because then maybe there's some things I've missed that I could be shown and understand and that would be wonderful. Thanks so much for watching. Stay tuned for my next video where I'll talk about my just okay books for the year and I'll see you next time. Bye. Cat hairs in my coffee. Of course.